So good morning again, everyone. This is Depelsha um, Magruder in Brooklyn. I have two sons who are 10 and 7. And just before we go over our, our brief overview of the organization, I want to ask everyone to lift up the family of Shalice Pena in prayer. I'm actually heading out right now um, for her funeral. She was a member of Mob United, one of our very first members. She went with us to um, Philadelphia two weeks after this group was started to rally at the DNC. And she also organized our first local meetup here in New York. She's from Staten Island, lived in Westchester County. And she has um, two children, a 13-year-old son and a five-year-old daughter. And um, we just really need to wrap our arms around them and pray for them. Also her husband, Miguel. So a number of us are going out to her funeral today. She died um, right around Thanksgiving of colon cancer. And she fought to the end. If you know her, if you were following her on Facebook, she was posting about her treatments and keeping hope and faith until the very end. So it is a very sad day uh, for Mob United for a mob gone too soon. And we will we'll say a prayer later in the call. Um, but first, I will give you a brief overview of the organization. Um, we have two organizations that strive to be a resource and a voice for moms. Um, one is Moms of Black Boys United, which is our 501c3 that focuses on providing information and support for moms and sons to help navigate all the situations our sons may find themselves in. The other organization is our 501c4, Mob United for Social Change, that really pushes the system to change um, and fights for policy change and legislation that impacts how our sons are treated by law enforcement and in society. We have a five-part approach to how we do this. We focus on influencing policy, changing perceptions of our sons and black males, all around the world, um, demonstrating our power politically and economically, also partnering strategically with other organizations and individuals, and promoting self-care. And I'm so excited because today's call is really about the fifth pillar, which is around promoting self-care and making sure that we take care of ourselves. I always say this is a long-term struggle and journey, and we have to have fuel for the fight. So we have to fortify ourselves, and I'm so excited to have Michael McGill on the call to help us talk through ways to do that. So with that, I will stop. So I'm about to get in the Uber, and I'm going to go on mute. Vanessa? If you're speaking, don't forget to start six. There we go. Hi. Um, just want to make sure that I uh, share a couple of pieces or one piece, two pieces of business before we dip into our call. Um, the uh, Martin Luther King Day of Service, Martin Luther King Jr.'s Day of Service is coming up in January. Our chapter leads are beginning to put together um, or have put together some thoughts around what the Day of Service will be for um, most of the, um, the local chapters that we have. Please, if you are a part of a chapter, please reach out to your chapter lead to um, either help them um, uh, pull the, uh, the day of service together or to participate in our day of service. This is the third one that we've done since the beginning of the organization, and it's a great opportunity for moms and sons to work together and provide service back to the community. It's something that, um, that is really important to us, and it gives us an opportunity to work with our sons. So I encourage you all to reach out to your chapter leads. If you don't know who your chapter lead is or if you're not sure if we have a chapter in your area, please feel free to reach out to the organization itself via info at mobunited.org or reach out to, to us um, through Facebook. You can uh, reach any of the admins um, through Facebook direct message. The other thing I'd like to add, and I don't really have a slide for it, is that next month our um, January call will feature um, something that we've done previously. We will have our virtual vision board party with Lucinda Cross. I think it's a fabulous way for us to kick off the year. We did it um, in 2017, January 2017, and it was such an amazing experience to have all the moms watching Lucinda um, via Facebook Live, and uh, we all worked together while Lucinda shared with us how to put together our vision boards. 
So in preparation for our vision board party, just a couple of quick things I want to share now that I will also remind via the group. Um, please gather your magazines throughout the month of December. Gather your magazines and your clippings to share um, the items that are um, – the most inspirational uh, to you for 2019, the things that you are motivated to achieve. Also make sure you gather some basic craft supplies, which would be a poster board for you to um, post your vision board on. Um, I suggest some fun sparkly markers, which I love using, um, and um, some trimmings. If you go to um, just the Target or even the dollar store, there are lots of trimmings that you can use for your vision board to help really spice it up and make it something that you want to keep around you to remind you day in, day out of what our goals are for 2019. So that will be for the next call that we have. That will be on January 12th. It will be our virtual vision board party with Lucinda Cross. And um, with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, which is Michael McGill, Jr. Um, Michael is a lifelong student of healthy relationships and human development, and he's an unrelenting optimist trust me, I know this firsthand, who believes that we can, great, um, we can be great individually, but we can also be unshakably extraordinary when we join and commune in healthy relationships with other people. And why it's really great to have Michael here, um, besides him uh, speaking about us being able to feed our souls, it's so important as we all work together as an organization or just participate in these um, calls with each other and sometimes even in the calls to action that we put together, that we're taking care of ourselves. Um, it's so important. If we're not taking care of ourselves, we can't take care of others, which is why I was so blessed to have Michael feed some, um, some life into me during our conversation the other day, and I hope that you will have the same experience with him. So with that, I'm going to introduce Michael, and if you could share some more about your background, Michael, and I'm going to switch this, um, this uh, presentation over to you, that would be fabulous. Don't forget to press star six to begin speaking. Okay, good morning. Can you confirm that you can hear me? I can hear you. Okay, awesome. Well, happy Saturday for all who are on the call. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. It's so good to connect with you all. Whew, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Okay, so I think I can see everything on here, right? Can you all see my screen? Yes, I think you can. Um, it takes just a second for the screen to pop up. Please let us know, okay. um, the other callers, please let me know when you see the screen. I've okay. got it. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, happy Saturday to you all. I hope that you are living well and feeling well and doing well. Um, and so this is my, my privilege, my job to be able to speak life into you, to encourage you, um, to remind you that who you are is great enough and that you matter and that if you were not in this world, the world would not be the same. And so I get the privilege of talking across the country to different organizations and groups, um, but very rarely do I get to really speak. Actually, this is the first time that I've got to speak to a group of, of black mothers. And how powerful of an opportunity is that for me? And so for you all welcoming me and joining me on this call, um, I'm so very grateful for your time and for your energy and for your light. So as the sister said, this is a work that, that brings me joy. I get to teach. I get to support and impart wisdom. Um, I get to do it on TV as well as in person. But I don't always get to pray before I not publicly, of course, before I talk. If I'm going into a corporate organization on a particular subject like self-care or whatnot, I don't always get to pray, of course, to the audience. So I wanted to just spend maybe just 30 seconds just uh, spending in a moment in prayer with you just because I believe in um, the power of affirmations and the power of going to our source, whatever your source is, the source of light, capital L-I-G-H-T, um, because we are in a time where our, I believe our souls desire healing and wholeness. And the only way that we can get that healing and wholeness, I believe, or one of the ways, is to go back to the creator who created us. So, if you will, uh, just breathe in deeply with me. I don't think we breathe in deeply enough. So often um, we 
are in the, the, the unconscious part of the brain. And so what we do when we breathe deeply is we really help the brain get back into a state of consciousness. And so just breathe in deeply. Just breathe in and count to the, to the number three. And then I want you to hold it for about three seconds. And then I want you to release it and really try to release it in three-second increments. So that means that really monitor your breath to at least let it be three or four seconds as you are releasing it. So let's do it one or two more times. So we're going to breathe in for three seconds. We're going to hold it for three seconds. And then we're going to release it for three seconds. We're going to do it one more time. We're going to breathe in for three seconds. We're going to hold it for three seconds. And we're going to release it for three seconds. And so hopefully if you are like me, you feel just a little sense of ease, really in the pit of the stomach, if you will. That's why sometimes whenever we are flustered or frustrated, or as my grandmother says, and you know you can't tell your grandma when she's saying the wrong word, but she says flustrated. I'm like, Granny, that ain't a word, but I'm going to let you say it. And so as my grandmother says, when we are frustrated, um, we notice whenever you do a big sigh or a Oh, and you feel some sense of relief, it's because you are literally giving more oxygen to the brain. And that is one powerful way to be present and to honor yourself, to honor your soul, to honor your mind by giving oxygen to the brain, really taking time to breathe deeply. Holy Spirit, uh, the source of light, we come to you now saying thank you for this divine opportunity, this divine moment of connection we thank you for uh, the ability to hear you. We thank you for the ability to receive you. We thank you for the ability to receive your love and your guidance and your grace and your truth. And I know personally, I'm asking for you to fall fresh. I'm asking for you, Holy Spirit, to fall fresh on me as I speak and to fall fresh on those who are listening and those who are not listening, those who are trying to listen. Fall fresh on someone today. Fall fresh on them that they may know that they are not alone on this journey. Fall fresh on the mother whose heart is crumbling. Fall fresh on the soul whose heart is broken, who just does not know the next way to go. Fall fresh on them today. Let them know that they are not alone. Fall fresh and let them know that they don't have to do it by themselves. Fall fresh and let them know that you can make a way out of no way. Fall fresh and let them know that your finger doesn't point where your hand has not made a way. Fall fresh and let them know that they are divine beings loved by you. Fall fresh and let them know that you have a purpose and power and destiny with them. Fall fresh and awaken the genius that lies dormant in their souls, in their DNA at the subatomic level. Would you fall fresh? For some of us, we have forgotten how divine we are. We've forgotten how powerful we are. But we need you to remind us that we have the exact DNA, the exact equipment, the exact insight and awareness and intellect to make it through the journey. Fall fresh on us. Fall fresh on our paths that they may be illuminated. And you know I'm in need of illumination, God. Fall fresh on our hearts that they will be healed and restored. Fall fresh on our minds that they will be encouraged and empowered and enlightened, fall fresh on us today. Fall fresh on us today. Fall fresh on us today. And so we come to you thanking you, believing that because we boldly asked for it with our mustard seed faith, that it is done. So thank you, Jesus. Amen. So anyway, uh, as they said, I'm Michael McGill, and so I know that we are on a time crunch, so I will peruse through some of this. If you have any questions, uh, I guess we can save them to the end. If it's a really urgent question, perhaps if you either want to write it down um, on the particular slide, or if you're joining us via the conference call, you can't do that. If you want to interrupt, please be all, by all means, you're more than able to do so. So as long as that, that's in accordance with how you all operate. So uh, I will go through. I see some folks saying, yes, hallelujah. I, that's funny. Okay. And please write back to me. I love to, to get feedback from you all. So that, that's a important for me on the journey. Fall fresh, yes. So here's a picture. This this particular jar that you can see, this glass that you can see, it's a picture. 
It's a picture that I see often many of us carry with us. It's a picture. Those who are on the call, I wish you could see it. It's a picture, and it literally is empty. But it reminds me of me in different spaces in my life. It reminds me sometimes of mothers who I know. It reminds me of folks who I get to see, people who are walking around this life, and their cup is empty. How many of you all can actually say that your cup is full? If you were to really become self-aware and self-reflective, where is your cup right now? Because we all have a cup. Our cup is a space. It's our capacity. It's our capacity to be replenished. It's our capacity to be renewed and restored. It's our capacity to receive information, to receive love, to receive light, to receive life. But it's also our capacity to give. And so it's my belief that through conversations like this, we can become more self-reflective. And it's through self-reflection that we can become more self-aware. And then it's through self-awareness that we can grow. Self-reflection causes self-awareness. Self-awareness causes growth. Growth. So I need you to be really reflective and to ask yourself, how full is your cup? Or how empty is your cup? Because so many of us, we go in day in and day out. We leave the house day in and day out. We show up at work day in and day out. We show up for our children day in and day out. You show up for your spouses day in and day out. You show up for those whom you love day in and day out. And then before you know it, your cup is on E. You're running on fumes, and then you're wondering why you can't make it running on E. How many of you can say that is your story? So what will you do about it? Because here's what I know and what I believe to be true based on my my few years of living, (laughs) based on my, my background in social psychology and sociology and what I know about the brain and the body and based on the thousands of folks who I get to see and talk to and what I call minister to, based on all the interactions that I see, I have learned this thing. We show up in life based on our levels of consciousness. We parent our sons, our daughters based on our own levels of consciousness. We show up and we lead at work based on our own levels of consciousness, which means that if we are consciously on E, we're going to parent on E. If we are consciously broken, we're going to parent in a broken way. If we are consciously uh, wounded, we're going to show up to work wounded. If we are consciously on E, we're going to be giving E to our families. If we are consciously on E, we're going to be giving E empty to ourselves. We show up from our own levels of consciousness. So how conscious are you of where you are? How conscious are you of you of how full or how light your cup is? That's how we show up. So I ask you this question to be mindful. Maybe you can even write this on your wall. I'm big on writing affirmations and questions and statements. If you have a mirror, get a dry erase marker, and those things come right off. Write it on the mirror in your bathroom, the mirror in your, your, your bedroom, to ask yourself this question, how am I showing up today? And if my cup is on empty, that requires a change in my consciousness so that I can be full and then give what's in excess. How do you show up? And what is, what is the capacity of your cup? And then some of y'all be mindful, too, about who you're in relationship with, because some of y'all are gallon-sized people, gallon-sized jars, trying to, to receive uh, love and support and validation from leader-sized people. Leader-sized of the, 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 the bottle that I have right now, it is, let's see, what does it say? It's 16 point, no, this is actually ounces, <laughs> 16.9 ounces. So you were in relationship with 16-ounce people, and you are a gallon-sized lover. Be mindful of how you're showing up. Be mindful of how you're showing up. You might be, or she or whomever might be sitting next to you in the bedroom, but be mindful of how you're showing up and know that you get to choose. You get to choose if your cup is on empty. You get to choose if your cup is full. You have the divine, inherent power of choice. Ask yourself that question. How are you going to show up? All right, my next slide. This one, if you notice, I love this slide, and I hope those who are, are on the phone call can, can see this, but this, this slide, it has two masks. One mask is happy, and then right in front of the mask, it's a sad mask. And the reason why I chose this mask is because I realized we all wear the mask. At, at different points in our lives, we wear the mask. I was just on a television the other day. And I come on morning shows in different cities and regions, and I've learned how to be more truthful and transparent because that, for me, is the way that I fill my cup up by telling the truth about what I believe in terms of how I am. 
instead of telling folks that I'm okay when I'm not, I'm learning how to tell the truth. It's a challenging process, but oh, it's very liberating, and I'm, I'm getting there. But so speaking of getting there to the liberation, here is the mask. We, it, it, in 1892, I was sharing this with Vanessa, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, a prolific writer. If you've never heard of him, Google him, check him out. But he wrote this poem in, in the 1800s. And it was really, in terms of giving you context, it was really about those who were enslaved. And I don't believe in calling people slaves because they weren't born slaves. They were enslaved, e enslaved. And even if they were born into slavery, they were still enslaved. And so he was talking about those who were indeed enslaved. And he was saying how when they were recently released, released, released and free, many of them still wore the mask. They were broken and brokenhearted and wounded, but they had to wear the mask for the survival apparatus. They had to still say yes, sir, and no, sir, to the massa for the survival apparatus. And so he says this poem, it says, we wear the mask, the mask that grins <laughs> and lies and hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. He says, this debt we pay to human guile with torn, broken, wounded, and bleeding hearts, we smile. He, I'll say it again. We wear the mask, the mask that grins and lies and hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile with torn, broken, wounded, and bleeding hearts, oh, we smile. We wear the mask. And how many of us can say when we show up and we wake up, we're wearing the mask. We're wearing the mask. We're really broken and wounded. And we don't have to stay that way. That is the, the power of it is we don't have to stay that way. Now I got, here we go. Now I got to figure out how to move these slides. We don't have to stay that way. So I ask you this question. Because I believe that everything that has happened to us, I believe that our behaviors, really, many of them, stem from how we were raised. And hear me when I say this, that is no heat, no shade, no judgment to our parents. Because what I've learned from my challenging relationship with my mother that I'm grateful that has been recreated, it was too broken to be restored. But I'm so grateful that after some time and some space and some reflection and some repentance, we were able to really recreate a relationship. Because my mother had me when she just didn't have the tools. And that impacted me, that impacted my mind, that impacted my heart, and it broke my soul in some areas. And that was the truth I had to own and acknowledge without any shame, blame, or guilt. But one thing that I know is that our childhood impacts us, and it shows us how we see, it, it supports us in how we see the world. And that does not mean we have to constantly and consistently keep operating in those same modalities, those same models, we don't have to operate in that way, but we need to be aware of what we were taught because in order to change something, you got to change your mind. I'm sorry, in order to change your behind where you're going, you got to change your mind. If you find your behind going in a place you don't like, then you first got to change your mind because the behind follows where the mind goes. So I, we have to learn where we come from, what seeds were planted, because all things are seeds. Every experience plants a seed. Every seed produces a harvest. What are you harvesting in your garden? That's a question to ask yourself. What are you harvesting in your garden? Everything is a seed, and we try to bury the seeds, but we realize when you bury seeds and they get the water and the sunlight, they're going to grow. We bury them alive, but they don't die. They show up in how you communicate. They show up in how you love. They show up in how you lead. They show up in how you receive love. They show up in how you dismiss yourself. They show up in how you devalue yourself. They show up in how you cuss people out. I'll say it again. They show up in how you cuss people out on the highway, how you cuss your spouse out, your kids out. They show up in how you don't ask for what you want or what you need. They show up like me when I was at the barbershop because I wasn't really taught how to find my voice and use my voice. So let me tell you, I'm at the barbershop getting my hair cut, didn't like the haircut. And instead of actually having the courage, the courage to tell this man that I didn't like the haircut, I just said, you know what, I'm going to be quiet. Because that was the seed in my life, that we don't really speak up too much. We don't really find our voice and use it in a graceful way. So I'm at the barbershop. I'm getting my hair cut. I ain't liking what he's doing. Instead of me actually having the courage to tell him, I leave. I don't show up again, and I know you ladies have done this, but this was the catch. Then I see him at the grocery store, and I'm doing everything I can to avoid the man because I don't want him to ask me, where you been? Where you been, Michael? Where you been, Vanessa? 
you, y'all, y'all know yet. Maybe it's just me. Maybe y'all got it together. I don't know. But I thought it was very interesting. And so as I become more reflective and aware, I get to ask myself this question. Where do some of these behaviors come from? Not to blame anybody, not to shame anybody, but to become aware. And so the next slide says that we all have models, and I've just briefly covered this. Everybody has a model. Every model, every person in your life, particularly when you were young, has modeled something for you. But hear me out. There is a difference between models and role models. Role models are who we aspire to be like. I'm not saying everybody has a role model. We can and we should, but not everybody does. But everybody has a model, a model that shows up, a model that teaches you something. And it's so important. Here's a spiritual practice that I want to give you, an assignment that I want to give you. And this assignment asks for you to write out who your models are. Write out your mother. And what did she teach you? What did she show you? Write out your father. What did he teach you? What did she show you? Write out your grandmother. What did he teach she teach you? What did she show you? Write out your step parent. What did he teach you? What did she show you? It didn't mean it had to be good lessons. It didn't mean it had to be bad lessons. It's what we call they are immutable, meaning they, it, it, the, the colloquialism is it is what it is. It's the, 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 the scholarly term is it's immutable facts, meaning that they are what they are because they are. They are not good. They are not bad. They just are. And then you get to choose if that's supporting you. Again, you get to choose. And so I think about my mother as a model. My mother and I gracefully say she didn't have the tools. As I tell folks often, I needed 10 pineapples and all she had were four because she was young. She had me before. What we now know about the brain is that at about age 25, the brain, the part of the brain, the frontal lobe, where you make critical decision-making skills, at that age is when you start really being able to make some critical decision-making skills. The part of that brain, well, if you have a kid at 17, 18, 19, 20, no shade, no heat, no judgment, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying what we know about the brain is that it makes it more challenging because there are parts of your brain that are not fully developed yet. So what? You cannot give what you don't have. And so in that, she got into a toxic relationship with her high school sweetheart. You know, he was one full of potential. But I heard this comedic say on Instagram that that, that Miss Shirley lady said, that, yeah, they got potential, potential to ruin your life. Be careful not to marry potential. <laughs> that still cracks me up. I tell you, I laugh at myself, even though ain't nobody here and I'm used to audience. But, or I can hear y'all at least. But. Um, potential, potential, potential to ruin people's lives. But in terms of him, he was one who had insurmountable potential, phenomenal potential. However, the models he had, he began to emulate. He watched his parents shoot up drugs. And so that's what he began to get to, the streets and the drug life. He was in and out of jail, in and out of jail. And my mother accommodated and tolerated His ill behavior, and I won't say bad, I'll say ill, because broken people make broken choices. Wounded people make wounded choices. Messed up people will mess you up if you stay in constant relationship with them. So I'm not saying he was bad. I'm saying he was broken. There's one, one says shame, the other says a reality. No need to shame him. He didn't know what he didn't know, but he was broken. And so in and out of jail, so we were in and out of houses. I went to about 11 different schools growing up, which means it was about a school a year for me almost because I graduated high school when I was a junior. So I was about a school a year, a school a semester. And so I purposefully tried to get the heck up out of there because I wanted to leave the hellhole. (laughs) And so that was his model. That was what he did. And so my mother accommodated those things. And so one thing that I had to learn as an adult was to find out how to find my voice and how to find out how to intentionally look for people who show me goodness and value and that the minute I see people consistently demeaning and diminishing me, I don't have to accommodate that. I remember chasing this girl. Her name was Essence. I probably should have told you the name, but don't try to look her up, but I didn't tell you the last name. But anyway, I chased this girl, and I ain't saying anything wrong with a, with a chase, but if somebody shows you they don't value you, choose people who choose you. And see, that was not modeled for me. 
It was models that you tolerate and you accommodate in small, subtle ways. Again, we're not blaming. We're saying it's the reality. So I'm chasing this girl, choosing this girl. She ain't choosing me. Hey, I remember 16, 17 years old. Would pick her up, do all these things. That girl had a boyfriend. And I'm still on Valentine's Day with, uh, with my hard-earned money because, look, I'm still in high school. At 16, I was about to graduate. And I needed to be paying for college and or get money for college and everything else. But I go on Valentine's Day. I can remember on Raytown Road in Kansas City, Missouri, I was there, got her this place from this flower shop. Was it Ray's Flowers? I don't know. It was across the street from the Christ Chopper. That's all I remember. But Kemp's Flowers, that was over a, that was almost 20 years ago, and I still remember. Let me go to therapy about that. But it was this flower place, Kim's Flowers, and I go and I get her these white lilies because she loved the lilies. And then I got her a box of chocolates, and I got her this little teddy bear, and then I wrote her a song. Oh, I was doing way too much, but that's okay. And so I go and I take it to church, and I give it to her. And she got a little funky boyfriend, and I knew she had a boyfriend whose name was also Michael, by the way. And he didn't get her nothing until like three weeks later, and it was a small little box of chocolate. He didn't get her nothing. And I'm still trying to show this girl, I like you, I see you. But the minute people show you consistently that they don't value you, you don't have to stay in the company. Choose people who choose you. And so that, we got to ask ourselves, where does that stuff come from? And so as I go deeper into the models, I look at my mother's model, and this allows me to give her more grace. You understand the, your mother and father and grandparents' story, it allows you to give them grace. Like my grandmother, now I get to work with her on her finances, and I'm, I'm more becoming more of a caregiver for her because she's getting older, and it's really hard to see her age. As we were even going over insurances the other day, I'm like, Granny, you overinsure. Why are you paying this much? And I could see how she got flustered, couldn't find documents. But I remember my grandmother raising me for a while and letting us live with her multiple times and taking care of me and being that model. My grandmother modeled for me how to, how to show up at work. My grandmother modeled for me how to be consistent. My grandmother, but my grandmother also modeled for my mother how to accommodate a man who demeans and diminishes. No shade, no heat. My grandmother accommodated a, a, a drunk, an abuser, a street man. They would literally be fist fighting. Because many people, particularly in that generation, believe that you had to accommodate and stay and you don't get divorces. But at some point, we got to say this thing ain't healthy. And so then when I see the pattern, when I see the connection, I look at my mother and I look at the man she chose. And then I look at her biological father. I look at the, if you look at the slide, my mother, she was streets, my mother's husband, excuse me, my mother was a gentle, is a gentle soul, very kind, was very kind and loving to him, but he was, a, he was street savvy and into the street life. If you look and you see, there's a connection. Her biological father, street savvy into the street life. My mother's husband was a drug dealer. Her biological father, he was into substance abuse. My mother's husband practiced infidelity. Her biological father practiced infidelity. My mother's husband had a child outside of marriage. My mother's biological father had a child outside of marriage. And the crazy part about it is that my mother found out at the age of 40-something, maybe in her late 30s, early 40s, that she worked, was it the same, uh, not building, but the same organization, worked for the city government as her sibling and didn't even know it. How crazy is that? The lies we live in, the secrets we endure, found out she had a sibling and didn't even know it who worked with her. I, I, I can't, I, whoa, how these things show up. And imagine how that's impacted my mother's heart. And so then imagine how she then parents and lives and shows up. We got to heal the trauma, heal the issues, heal from our stories. Because these things will take you out. Like I said in the video, if trauma will take you, if you don't take trauma out, trauma will take you out. And so getting back to this. So her, 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 husband, was abusive, oh, excuse me. her husband was abusive and toxic. Uh, let's see. Her father was abusive and toxic. Um, her husband had challenges with alcohol. Her father uh, was addicted to alcohol. Her husband died at 47, and he was murdered. We were at the gas station, and I remember seeing them pull on a rainy November day, them pulling the, the yellow sheet over his body. And I remember the rain falling, and I remember my phone going dead. I remember really feeling numb, saying, how can this be? He was shot six times, and to see it, and to see his body, and to see it there, the impact that had. And then I think about my mother's husband, who's in his late 30s, 
37 when he died. I don't believe these are just coincidences. It's the power of the models, the power of the models. And so this one is number eight, the number eight, the number eight, the number eight. It is a number that many of us, I believe, should be more aware of, not this particular number, but what the number exemplifies. And the number exemplifies what many physicians, primary care physicians, what they've called um, the ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Now, again, I say this not to shame, shade, or blame, but for us to become aware. There's a difference between blaming somebody and helping them become aware. It's the difference between blaming your parents and you being aware. <laughs> so if you look at this, it's what we call ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Now, when I'm, I'm going to give a, a context to it, it is not the end-all, be-all. It is not a death sentence. It is not um, a, a, a diagnosis, okay? It is none of that stuff. It's just a tool, a general tool for you to be made aware of. You can even find it on Google, find the quiz on Google. You just go type in Google, then type in ACES, A-C-E-S, and then Google and see what, um, what the questions are. There are 10 questions, and, in fact, if you're on the screen, I can show them to you. But there are 10 questions. Uh, let's see. So 10 questions. Let me try to get to the screen that has them. And if you look here, if you can see what I can see, and I hope you all can, it says here, uh, the different ACEs. So just go to, you know, ACEs too high. But this is actually an NPR article that was done about it. Um, and so it gives you the option to actually do the quiz on the ACEs or on the NPR website. So I encourage you all to review that. But it says here, uh, ACEs, they, they measure three different types of, they measure three different types of adverse experiences. Abuse, which is physical, emotional, sexual. They uh, look at neglect, physical and emotional, as well as household dysfunction, such as divorce, incarcerated relatives, mental illness, substance abuse, and the mother being treated violently. And so they show you here that with um, high numbers, high ACEs scores, you are more likely to be connected to smoking, alcoholism, drug use, missed days of work. There's even a connection. It's what we call the body bears the burden, how the body bears the burden of the mind. And it shows how that with a high adverse score that you can have, you are more connected to, again, it's possible, where you have a higher probability of being connected to being obese, diabetes, depression, multiple suicide attempts, um, sexually transmitted diseases. How is that? It's because people tend to be more risky uh, when they don't practice that self-care and soul care. They tend to do riskier activities, not practice self-care. So that doesn't mean you're going to get it just because you, <laughs> you had a high score. It's how the score impacts the behaviors. The score impacts or the issues, the trauma impacts the behaviors that we do. And so it also says there's a connection when we don't heal some of the trauma how it impacts the heart. We're more inclined to experience heart disease, cancer, stroke, COPD, and broken bones. But to also note here, it says it's something that's very common in trauma, difficulty in regulating emotions and behavior. If that is you, it's something you may want to be aware of. And then it even also explains, and this is big, this is why a lot of kids may get in trouble in the classrooms. I used to be a classroom teacher. I was a middle school, high school teacher, school counselor. Now I work with, with people, families, groups, corporations, organizations. But I've been in schools where I see that stuff. And so it's the power of the trauma. So I want to go over a few of these with you real quick, Okay. All right, so a few of them. There's 10 questions. One, and I'm going to ask you this, and perhaps while you're on the call, you can ask yourself these questions. One says, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid you might be physically hurt? Now, be mindful. This is about context, culturally speaking, because, of course, who they did this test on were more affluent people in particular communities, and so – they don't always take into consideration culture. So this is really based on your experience, what you believed. If you believed it was, you know what, it, it crossed the line, it's based on your experience. So you, you own your experience. If this is what you believe, if you believe that, that this occurred, then put a yes or, or give, give yourself a number one. If, hopefully you all can see the screen too. Number two, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, and again, the key word is often or very often, push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured, again, based on your experience, put a one or a zero. Number three, and there are 10 of these, number three, did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you, or have you touched their body in a sexual way? 
or attempt to actually have oral, anal, or vaginal intercourse with you. Uh, that's for number three, put a one there or a zero. Number four, did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special? or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other. This is about emotional connection. So that's for number four. And if you notice, some of these, many of us have discounted like, oh, that's not a big deal, but what if it's bigger than what we thought it was? Number five, did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, uh, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you? or were your parents too drunk or too high to take care of you or to take you to the doctor if needed? We put a one there or a zero. Number six, were your parents ever separated or divorced? Put a one there or a zero. And I would even add, have you experienced or seen someone be murdered? How the fact that that's not on here or death is not on here is striking to me. So I'm going to do my own aces. Um, number seven, was your mother or stepmother often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her? Or sometimes, often or very often, kicked, bitten, hit with the fist, or hit with something hard, or ever repeatedly hit over at least a few minutes, or was she threatened with a gun or a knife? That's something to ask yourself that question. And I do a lot of domestic violence counseling at hospitals, and when I notice, I see sometimes we, when, when this is an experience, we minimize it. But when I see some of the patients, I look at the patterns, and I see many of them, they've grown up in households that were also domestically or, or abusive. When I work with some of the survivors, they are also, they come from households where this many, not all, of course, but some come from households where this was some type of a factor in some way. And then number eight, did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs? So put a yes or a one or a zero there. Number nine, was a household member depressed or mentally ill or did a household member attempt suicide? Put a one there or a zero. And then did a household member go to prison? So if you notice, you just go to ACES, A-C-E-S, ACES, too high dot com. And then just Google ACES to get your score. Google the NPR article on ACES. You can take the quiz there. And it's not used as an end-all, be-all, because if you look back at my number, it's a number eight. And with the right tools, you get to heal and overcome. But I want you to be aware of your number to give you awareness, not a diagnosis. This is not a medical physician giving you something. I'm not a medical doctor, okay? Uh, this, this is me giving you insight and awareness for you to say, hmm, it's something to be aware of, and it might tell me where there's some healing uh, support that I can get and I need to do. So this one, if you look at this video of the brain, it shows us how trauma shows up. Trauma, trauma, trauma. Trauma shows up. On the left side, this, if you can see my screen, is a healthy brain. On the right side, this is an unhealthy brain. So for those who are not brain nerds like me, I'm going to show you what this means real quick. Look at the chart down here. Red means most active. Yellow means least active. Green means, green means moderate. I'm sorry. Red means most active. Then there's yellow. Then there's green for moderately active. Then purple for least. And then black for severe least. And if you see here, in this diagram, on this particular diagram, if you notice, it says the red part of the brain that's the most active here is the frontal lobe. This is the front. Remember what I said earlier. The frontal lobe does what? The frontal lobe is great for regulation. It's great for those executive skills. The frontal lobe is the part of the brain where you make critical decision and reasoning skills. That's an important part of the brain. Here, the limbic system where I'm pointing in the middle, it is the emotional part of the brain. You want to have some green, some a little bit of red on the edges, some yellow. That's where you can give and receive love. You get your emotional capacity. And then red is what we call the animal brain, the reptilian brain, the brain stem. This is your emergency brain, your fight or flight or freeze or submit, the part of your brain that's all about regulation, like it tells your body to breathe. It's all about your survival brain. And if you notice, in the abused brain, the survival brain is very active and the rational brain is not as active. In the healthy brain, the rational brain is active. The, sur the survival brain is not as active. It's moderately active which is what we need. If you also notice a difference in the emotional section, in the abused brain, they're not very emotional slash, and doesn't mean they're not, they're not emotional, they're not able to regulate emotions well, i.e. temper, control, self-regulation, give and receive love, all that stuff. So if you see in both of those examples, 
That's what it looks like. So on the healthy brain, you see there's healthy red, a little bit of red, not too much, a little bit of black, not much, a little bit of purple, green, yellow. It shows the healthy mirrors. They can regulate emotions, self-sufficient, secure, able to give and receive love with the proper work, of course. So this just shows you what they look like. But the blessing is that the brains are what we call its plasticity. There's a plasticity of the brain, which means that with the proper exercises, activity, with the proper work, brain can change and heal and mold over time. Brains are not set in stone. If you're active, if you exercise, when you do counseling, when you do actually trauma healing work, meditation, things like that on a consistent basis, that supports you. And so that brings me to my next slide, which says self-care. It's the small things. If you notice here, someone tell your car, if you in the car, tell your son, tell your boo, who you probably wish wasn't even there, I don't know, tell somebody next to you, it's the small things. It's the small things that become big things, the small things in our lives. You know, I go to the gym, and y'all can't see me now, but I'm getting me these gains, okay? You can't tell me nothing. I'm getting these gains, y'all. I'm going to get me a boo with these gains. No, I'm just kidding. I don't want a boo right now, but that's not the point. I'm telling you, I'm getting these gains in the gym. And so when you go to the gym and you're lifting and you're pushing and you're, you're, you're growing your muscles, the muscles actually have to be torn apart first before they are then restored and built up. Isn't that a juxtaposition? I thought I would go to the gym and the muscles would automatically build, but they first have to be torn down in order to be built back up. What does that tell you about life? And so when I think about the power of the gym, it's the small things that lead to the muscles growing. It's the consistency going regularly. It is consistently, gradually adding more weights over time. It is consistently drinking water and increasing your water intake. It's evaluating your macros and your micros, your calories, your good fats, your bad fats all that good stuff, and over time, you see change. You do not go in the gym on Monday, and by Thursday, you lost all your weight or you've made all your gains. It just doesn't work that way. You know, now, some people, it might. You know, I think I was at uh, Depelsha. She was saying that uh, we were talking about the gym last time on the other call. It might work for her, but it ain't working for me. It's taking these small, intentional steps where I got to be consistently in the gym doing the work and also improving my behaviors. The same things are true about self-care. It's the small things. And I showed you here a picture of a marble jar because just like in a marble jar, it's the things that we do that increase the marble jar's fullness. So it's some marbles are small, some are medium-sized, but they're all on average a general size. And it's only when you put multiple marbles in the jar that you are able to heal, overcome, become more resilient, and grow. It's the small things that we do that change our lives. Rarely is it big things, explosive things. It's the small things that we do that make an impact, that change our lives. Let that give you hope, but also encourage you to be ye consistent. I used to teach English, so I love old English. Be ye consistent. Let me give you an example of what I mean by it's the small things. I mean asking yourself this question, how often do I affirm who I am and what I can do? What if you wrote out every single day for the next 30, 40, 60, 90 days or until the end of the year, for the next, for the, until the end of the year, every single day, writing out 20 affirmations of who you are and what you can do? Small things. It's the small thing. Remind yourself who you are, what you can do. You are a child of love and light and guidance. You are a child of divine love, light, and guidance. You have all that you need, the equipment that you need to make it through the journey. You are enough. You are value and valuable. I'm going to say that again. So you remember when you go to your job, you are value. You bring value. You carry value, and you are valuable. You are enough. You are light. You are love. You are goodness. So if you are not in a quality relationship where your energy is reciprocated and where you are celebrated and you are continually dismissed, dishonored, and lowly accommodated, then you might want to evaluate if that is a relationship for you. Because that's another self-care tip. Regularly evaluate your relationships. We know from Harvard, they did a recent or published a 75-year longitudinal study that showed the impact that relationships have 
on the body and the mind. They showed those who were in quality relationships. It didn't matter about the quantity, but the quality, that their central nervous system was healthier. Their brains were healthier. They even lived longer. They were more able to fight off disease. That's why some research shows men who are married tend to live longer and are healthier because they're in quality relationships with a woman or person, should I say, who pushes them to be healthy. And so when you think about that stuff, when you think about your relationships, it showed how the, the central nervous system was healthier. It showed all these benefits. It even showed that's why when you look at people who retire, if they're not in regular community with others, I know an example of a guy who retired, and because he lived in solitude and in silos, he passed away shortly after. I believe that stuff is real because we were born for quality relationships and connection. One way that we can indeed heal trauma is through quality relationships. Now, I'm not saying be broke down. Now, we all are broken in some aspect, but I ain't saying go into a relationship being broke down. It's the difference between broken and broke down on the side of the road. You can't do that now. But there are, oh, there are some things that we get from being in healthy relationship, not just romantic, <laughs> but I'm talking about general relationships. It's the power of relationships. Also, the power of affirmation. Like I said that before, writing down affirmations. On my bathroom mirror, I write out affirmations on the wall, on the, 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 the mirror with my dry erase board marker, and I write out and I change them up seasonally I, because I love big words. I say I am bodacious, meaning I am bold and brave and brilliant. I am courage. I am light. I am forgiveness. I forgive those who harm me, and I forgive myself. I am love. I am goodness. Writing out those affirmations, I have courage. I am beauty. Um, I also write out gratitude, the power of gratitude. That's, that's, these are small, intentional things that we can do that can support us. Also, meditation, being able to get still and to get centered and to be able to reflect and to be in a quiet space, a healthy space regularly, the research shows, and i got just a few more minutes, the research shows that when we are in those spaces, when we are meditating, when we are, rele- when we are just sitting in stillness, we release pressure from the brain, and we are able to allow our brains to regulate and meditate better. Also, another tool for self-care, and it's one thing that has supported my mother and I and our relationship, is through the art of self-forgiveness. First of all, for me in itself, self-forgiveness is big. I look back over my life, and I think of things that I should have done, financial mistakes that I had no business making, but then I realized I didn't have a right model. I didn't learn about credit scores until I was, I don't know how old. I had no idea that you shouldn't be using more than 10, 15% of your available credit when it's time to pay that bill. I mean, it's all these little things that I didn't even know. So I'm making all these silly financial mistakes that I had no idea about. And I had to give myself the grace and say, you did the best you could with what you know. But as Maya Angelou says, when you know better, you do better. And now that I've gotten the tools, I'm doing better. I still slip up from time to time. And then I ask myself, why, how? Give yourself the grace and then move on. But self-forgiveness is real. I believe that it was even with my mother through her learning, and she still is learning on her process of self-forgiveness, we were able to have hard conversations. Because one thing my mother showed me, especially, and this helped me give her more grace to forgive, because forgiveness is a self-care principle. It's one thing that she showed me, and it was that if you are a parent and you fail your babies, That is a hard truth to sit in and to swallow. That's painful. It's painful, but it's powerful, as they say. It's painful, but it's necessary. The same way we have to bury seeds and we have to bury ourselves sometimes, burying something is painful, but it's necessary and it's powerful to get to the end result. Birthing a child is painful, but it's miraculous and powerful. They talk about the fact that when children are born, It is the most traumatizing experience they will endure, or one of them, should I say. It's very traumatizing, yet they don't even remember it. It's painful for the mother, but it's a miraculous miracle. Now, I've never done that, don't ever want to do that. You couldn't pay me to be a woman, but that's just not the point. It's painful, but it's powerful. And so when I realized that that how painful it had to be for my mother, I can give her grace. When I realized for my father, for him, We're not in in, in quality relationship because there are just certain um, conversations he's just not ready to have. And if we can't have a truthful relationship, 
I have to meet you where you are and kind of back you up and leave you over where you are. I can't, we, if it's not healthy, we can't move forward. But I give him grace because I now realize he messed up. He failed, and for him to have to endure that type of pain, because my father, my biological father, he always said he would never do what his father did to him, and yet he did it. We wouldn't talk for years at a time when I was younger. For him to have to own that, I bet it's very painful. Now, I'm not excusing his behavior because it was ill, but I am giving an explanation, a difference between excuse and explanation. Excuse says, it is who they are, and, and, and ooh, woe, it's them. But explanation says it wasn't good. It wasn't appropriate. But I better understand, and I can move forward accordingly. So anyway, as my mother has been able to learn to forgive herself, she's been able to parent in a more conscious way. She said to me on Monday when I was driving to the airport, I had to go to L.A. and to, I'm in D.C. now for some work. And as I was headed to the airport, she said, I just want you and your sister's heart to be healed. My sister's actually still in high school. We are much, much of an age gap, and she's like my baby kind because her, her dad isn't here. But when I heard her say that, I said to her, I said, whoa, but what if, what if the key to our healing, and particularly my sister's, is the key to you healing your heart? I'll leave you with that. What if the key to them healing is you healing your heart, you getting the tools, you getting the awareness and the conscious and the support. So often we're showing up for our kids. We're showing up in our marriages. We're trying to do, 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 but we're not serving our own souls. And what if the key to them being well and living well and doing well is by you showing up for yourself? And then I ask you this question that it says in this slide, how often do you ask for what you want? Because what I've learned about that barber experience that I said earlier is when I don't ask for what I want, it's me unconsciously telling myself I am not worthy of it. Now, I'm not saying be radical and be crazy and ask for things that are just wrong, but I'm saying show up. Ask for what you want. If you want more money, ask for it. What's wrong with asking? The Queen of England, when she's ready to get off from that table, she picks her purse up, puts it on the table. That's the sign to everybody at that table, I'm ready to go. She knows her power, her worth, and her royalty. Now, she might not get everything she asks for. Maybe she will. I don't know. But I bet, she, I bet you she's going to have the mitigated gall to ask. <laughs> you ask for what you want. It's my question for you. How often do you ask for what you want? Ask for what you need. Ask for that which will support you in your relationships, in your life, in your love life, in your work life with your children from yourself. Do you honor and believe in yourself enough to ask for what you need, you desire, you want? How often do you ask yourself for what you want and give yourself grace? And I'll end you with this, the power of self-care. What happens when it's too late? If you are not careful, you, we, can, we can damage our brains. We damage our souls. I don't want you to wait another day to practice and to get you a spiritual model, a healthy self-care plan that will support you. Maybe it's the art of forgiveness. Maybe it's having those hard conversations that you've been trying to avoid or bury because they're too painful or too challenging. Get the tools. Get the support. Maybe it's writing down who your models were and what they taught you to become more self-aware. There, there's so much we can do. Maybe it's the art of meditation and reflection. Maybe it's the art as I'm doing a recap of affirmations and declaring who you are and what you can do every single day for the next few, for the next few weeks until the year is over and then continuing that in the next year. You have to feed your brain that which is good and quality if you want to do well in life. I'll say that again. You have to feed your brain that which is good and quality if you want to do well in life. It's input-output method. You cannot put in junk and expect good to come out. You cannot put in blankety-blank and expect good to come out. You cannot put in trash and expect a flower garden to come out. No, no, no. Now, you may have to go through a manure to get to the good garden, but that's a different story. What are you feeding your brain? 
and your soul consciously every day. You have to be aware of those things. I implore you, I beg you for the sake of your heart, for the sake of those who have endured an insurmountable tragic loss. One of the, the young people who I mentor, he was my former student, who I ended up actually taking in for a while because his grandmother couldn't help him and he, his parents passed away. My, my biggest hurt for him and that he has not been able to acknowledge his pain from his parents passing away. And it's shown up in how he was showing up. I had him when he was in middle school, and then I put him when he was back in high school, he kind of found, got into his own crowd and started doing stuff. But the, the fact is, when you don't acknowledge your pain, when you don't speak life to yourself, when you don't give yourself permission to be in pain and to own your pain and to deal with it, as my mother says, she goes, it's hard because I just don't want to start weeping. Well, you're going to have to weep, and you're going to have to give yourself permission to cry and not be afraid, not have to explain or apologize. Do it, because if you don't, it's going to show up in every area of your life. I was at the grocery store, y'all, at the grocery store seeing this father and son, this father called his son Prince. And when I saw that, I turned around, my head looked, and I couldn't stop staring. I even followed him around for a little bit, and I'm not weird or anything like that. Maybe I am a little weird in a good way, but I followed him, and then here I am trying to get me some green peppers and some other stuff, and I see him, and I hear him say Prince, and I just got a couple of tears coming. I'm like, oh, why am I crying? Get yourself together. But that showed me that's an area of work for me. And it may always be continual work because whether you had your father or not, you still long for that intimate relationship. And I just couldn't get my daddy to, and I can't. That's just the reality. But to be able to honor and own and acknowledge that, that I won't have that relationship, at least in this season, and that's, I'll, I'll be okay. But to at least own and acknowledge give my soul permission to be and to feel and then to figure out how to deal and heal and move forward accordingly. I'm telling you, this stuff works. That's why counseling is effective if you've never gone. It's good because it helps you with a good counselor reflect and they help you on your journey. They don't give you advice. They don't tell you what to do. What we in the helpers profession, what we do is we support you on your path to wholeness and healing, and we help you find another way, another way of being and living and thinking and loving and leading. So that's what I have for you. That's really what I got for you. And I'll, I'll, if I can get 30 more seconds, I'll leave you with the story of Mephibosheth. I'm not a theologian, not a biblical scholar, but I like this story because it shows me so much about brokenness and life. Mephibosheth was one in the Bible, when was it Samuel, I believe, if you want to Google the story of Mephibosheth, again, Michael, I know stories. I'm a storyteller, and I'm a little animated, if you can't tell, but I'm not a theologian. However, in this story with Mephibosheth, he was very young, and his father, his father was, would be, you know, David and Saul had issues. David and Saul and, and, and then the other father had some issues, and what we know is that when King David became king, you would typically take out the lineage of the previous reign, the previous rule, because you don't want them to come back and try to take your spot. So Saul and Jonathan were wiped out, were knocked out. I believe Jonathan actually committed suicide, or Saul committed suicide. Uh, Jonathan died in the war, in the battle, which were Mephibosheth's father and grandfather. And so Mephibosheth was all alone as a baby. His grandfather committed suicide. His father died in the army in the war. And the, the nurses and the caregivers knew if we don't care for him, then what will happen? The next reign, the next kingdom will come and take him out because that was customary. So as they quickly picked him up, and they quickly took him away. What do they do? They accidentally dropped him. They dropped baby Mephibosheth. And in dropping him, he became crippled. His legs were broken. He could not move. So he had to be carried. He was crippled. Who in here is crippled because the ones who were designed to care for you? For Mephibosheth, it was his father and grandfather. They left. The nurses, they dropped him. Can you say the ones who were designed to care for you dropped you? That's a real reality to own and acknowledge. Again, not to blame, not to shame, but to become aware. The ones who were designed to care for old Prince Mephibosheth, <laughs> they dropped him. 
And so Mephibosheth lived a life in Lodabar. Lodabar was described as a place of brokenness and a place of desolate and poverty where there was no growth. There was no quality land. There was no, nothing that was actually growing. It was Lodabar. And so in him living in Lodabar, he was there for years, 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 years in silence, in solitude. And then finally, one day, King David said, is there anybody from the house of Saul? And Saul was his friend. Remember, Saul was Mephibosheth's daddy and King David's friend. They were fighting, though. Is there anybody from the house of Saul who I can be good to? That was his opening. And he went in. They said, yeah, we think Mephibosheth is still alive somewhere. And they went in. They found him. And he said to Mephibosheth, you will always have a seat at the table. So that gives me hope in that even when we feel broken and alone, even when we feel in desolate and in Lodabar and in poverty and impoverished, when we are from the source of light, which we are, there is always another way. Please cling to the promise. There is always another way. There is always another way. There is always another way. So that's my hope and my prayer for you. The last slide that I showed that you can just look at, it's a self-care model. It gives you insight for the emotional, physical, professional, psychological, spiritual care. We've talked about all of that stuff, but I want to leave you with that. There is another way, just like with Mephibosheth. Maybe you've been broken. Maybe you've been crippled from the ones who were designed to care for you, and they dropped the ball. And we can acknowledge that, but we can also heal from that. Because if we don't heal it and address it, or excuse me, if we don't address it, we don't heal it. If we don't heal it and deal with it, we won't grow from it. I'm imploring you to go through the hard and painful but powerful process of growth because just like with Mephibosheth, there is another way. I love you. If you haven't heard it today on this Saturday morning, I love you. I believe in you. I'm rooting for you from wherever I am to where you are because we are all connected to light. Remember, there is another way. So now let's see. I'm going to look up on this, this thing and see if y'all have any questions. Uh, all right. Let's see. Thank you yes. so much. It's Vanessa. Thank you so much. This was did not tell y'all he was amazing. <laughs> Anybody who saw this yes, call that saw my, my post, did I not tell y'all that he was amazing? Thank you so much um, for, for just built, pouring into us today. Um, like you said at the beginning of the, the call when you showed us the, the slide of the picture, um, I'm sure, you know, you've, you've definitely helped fill me up today, and I hope um, some of the other moms that are on the call um, felt that as well. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I didn't see any big questions on the, in the chat, but if you do, please feel free to ask, um, press star, I mean, I'm sorry, pound six before you speak. Thank you. And someone did ask a question about what I meant by cultural tweaking in terms of the ACEs. It's, it's from a research standpoint, you want to be careful who your population pool is. And if, you, if, you're, if you're only sampling the pool of affluent, you know, affluent people, whether they're, whatever their, their background is, you, won't, you, may not get this, you may not ask the same questions you would ask those who may have grown up in other cultural areas, whether it's rural areas urban areas, in the, in the deep, deep hood, you know, it just, so it's just, it's, it's some cultural tweaking. I don't believe they, they really had the best population sample pool, but I still support the research in its principle, just the, 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 the pool who they use. There are additional questions I would have asked that we as a community need to be aware of, too. So that's what I mean by cultural tweaking for those who ask that question. But someone else have a question? I like questions, y'all, and I got, I don't know how much time you have. Hi. Um, this is Danielle. Uh, I want to thank you for your um, presentation. Um, I have a, a master's in counseling psychology, even though I'm not actively practicing it. I was faced with a trauma just recently um, with the losing of my son. And um, one of the things, just having studied psychology and counseling, is that I put into practice that I know to be true is the giving yourself permission 
to feel everything that you feel about the traumatic incident or the trauma in your life and to also forgiving yourself. Mm -hmm. You may not have been there. You may not have been a part of it, but a lot of us still own our traumas that are passed down to us or presented at our door front. And so I want to thank you for that piece because I think so often that part is missing when you are allowed to mm -hmm. grieve and allowed to react, allowed mm -hmm. to feel everything you need to feel so that it can be brought to your awareness and your attention is no longer hidden and you don't have to suffer in silence. So I just yeah. want to say thank you for that. Thank you, and thank you for the work that you do, and I hope that as you continue on your journey of soul care, you'll be able to use that to help other people in our profession. Um, but you're so right. So many of us, and if you needed it today, y'all, so many of us need the permission to be liberated and to feel what we feel and to not suffer in silence. Yes, amen to all of that. Ashe and Saleh, yes. Amen. Anybody else have any questions? Well, if you don't have any more questions for me, if you want to I, connect um, on social I media, it's at Michael McGill Jr., and I would love to connect with you all. Did somebody say something? Yeah, it's Vanessa. So oh. um, you, we thought that your, the prayer that you did to open us up was so wonderful, and I think that um, the words that you shared with us are so powerful. Um, I hate to ask and, and put you on the spot, but if you could please close um, our call out with, um, you know, with another prayer, um, it would really, I think, would just be amazing for us because I think you've, like I said, just done so much to fill us up already, and, and we'd love mm. to um, to close out with you. You were really, okay. really moved. Thank you so much. Well, be encouraged. Thank you for that, Vanessa. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all those who stayed and listened to the call, and thank you for receiving the offering that I bring. Um, I'd love to stay in touch with all of the mothers, so connect with me. Be encouraged on your journey, and I wish you all the healing that the divine hand has given you. And so uh, maybe wait about five seconds, and if nobody else has any questions, I'll, I'll go ahead into the prayer. So. <sighs> Thank you, God. Thank you for being a divine source of light and a love and liberty and wholeness for us. Thank you for saying that even when we are messed up and broken, you still love us and you still choose us. Thank you that we are bigger and that you, you remind us, you ordain us that we are bigger than our biggest mistake. We are bigger than our biggest financial mistake. We are bigger than our biggest emotional mistake. We are bigger than our biggest relational mistake. We are bigger than our biggest parenting mistake. We are bigger than our biggest soul mistake. Thank you for reminding us that there is room at the table for us, and we are chosen. We are not forsaken. We are not abandoned. We are loved. We are fully known and loved and needed and chosen by you. Thank you that you see highly enough of us. So often, many of us have been told that we are not good enough and worthy enough and a light field enough to be chosen, whether it's by partners, whether it was by parents or friends or family, but in you, we are enough. Remind us that in our deepest and darkest hours, when pain riddles our hearts and our minds and our souls so badly, remind us that when we feel so alone in the midnight hour, when we can't even get out of bed, remind us that when we feel like we have no other way to go, but some of us have gotten on this call and may not even know where our next meal is coming from. Some of us have gotten on this call and don't even know what we are supposed to do with the, seat, with the tools that we have in front of us, with the pain and the brokenness that we have in front of us. But remind us that you take broken and you turn it into beautiful, that you remind us that you delight in our brokenness. You delight because you get to make beauty from ashes. Remind us. Encourage us. Fill us, and Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us today. Fall fresh on our hearts that they may be healed. Fall fresh on our minds that they will be enlightened. Fall fresh on our pathways and purposes and our destinies 
that they will be illuminated because some of us are lost and confused and just don't know where to go. Fall fresh on our consciousness. Fall fresh on us today. Fall fresh on us today. Fall fresh on the damaged parts of our souls that have been damaged for years. Fall fresh on the parts of us that we have buried and we have hidden because it's too painful to talk about. It's too painful to acknowledge. Fall fresh on those parts. Give us the courage to heal. Give us the courage to have hard conversations. Give us the courage to look ourselves in the mirror and see what you see when you created us. Fall fresh on us today. Fall fresh on us, divine source of light and love and liberty. Fall fresh on us today. For whom the sun sets free, may we be free indeed. Fall fresh on us today. It's in your son's name we ask for, come believing and declaring that it is done. And that by your stripes we are made, perf- are, we are made perfect and you are made perfect through us, through our weakness. And we are healed. Fall fresh on us today. In your son's name of life and love, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much. And thank you, ladies, for joining us this week. Um, We will be back at it again next year, um, January 12th, our virtual vision board party with Lucinda Cross. I um, hope to see you all through the interwebs and Have a happy and safe holidays. If I don't speak to uh, some of you before then, on behalf of um, the Pelsha, I know she's at the funeral for Shal right now, as well as um, Tammy and some of our other sisters in New York. Um, So a couple of us that are here, we want to wish everyone a happy holiday. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Love you, Mom.